So, and without further ado, I will jump right in. So, my name is Michaela Jackson, and I am the Prevention Policy Manager for the Hepatitis B Foundation. And today, we will be hearing from myself, uh, Sonia Clay, who is the Government Relations Consultant from Vaccinate Your Family, and Sha Wang, who is an infectious disease physician um, at the Virginia Mason Medical Center in, in Washington State. And so we are going to be speaking about a path to universal adult hepatitis B vaccination um, through policy perspectives, clinical perspectives. And I'm going to start uh, the whole conversation off with speaking about challenges uh, to the current uh, universal hepatitis B uh, adult vaccination platform that we are going into today. Oh, sorry about that. We're going to start off with a little bit of background. What is the current state of adult hepatitis B vaccination in the US? To begin, there are up to 80,000 new cases a year. Uh, this is despite having an effective vaccine. We know that the vaccine works. It's over 1 billion doses have been distributed worldwide. But yet in the US, up to 2.2 million people are living with hepatitis B infection and 80,000 new cases a year. 93 million Americans are considered to be high risk for hepatitis B as of 2014. That number is quite high as you guys um, can tell and it might be a little bit startling to you. We just worked these numbers out ourselves uh, earlier this year. And despite the amount of Americans that are currently considered to be high risk, just 25% of adults have been fully immunized. So that means they've had all of their doses, whether it's a two dose vaccine or the three dose vaccine. And the baby boomers, Generation X and millennials make up 63% of uh, the US uh, adult population. And this is really significant because these groups were born before the adult, um, I'm sorry, the infant recommendation for universal hepatitis B. So they missed that uh, recommendation in 1991. And many of them are most likely living out there not knowing that they are unvaccinated for hepatitis B. Um, so that means that they are susceptible. So we have a few available vaccines right now. The three dose, we have Ingex B and Recombivax. And for the two dose vaccine, we have Hep Slap B, which can be given in two, uh, I mean, sorry, yeah, two doses, one month. And for the three dose, that's over the span of six months. And then there's also Tonorex, which is hepatitis A and B combination. Um, so those are the types of vaccines that are currently given and that we currently have on the market. And our current recommendations that we have from uh, any federal agent agency mainly come from the uh, CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And so they state that um, one or more risk factors out of a list that we will be talking about later today or anybody who wants to be vaccinated should be able to access the vaccine. Um, so I suggest that you guys remember that because the last part about anybody who wants to be vaccinated is pretty key when it comes to availability and access. So who do we have missing from our current guidelines? It seems right now that the guidelines are pretty comprehensive from what we hear. Anybody who can be back, who wants to be vaccinated and out of a long comprehensive list. But when you take a closer look at who might actually be at risk for hepatitis B, uh, you can see that there's a few key groups that are missing. So to start with, we have those that, who are unaware of certain comorbidities. So approximately 50% of people living with hepatitis C 25% of people living with diabetes and 14% of people living with HIV are unaware that they have these. So if they're going to their doctors and they are, you know, just having a regular checkup, they don't really know, the doctor doesn't know, nobody knows that they are at risk for hepatitis B for having one of these listed comorbidities if they themselves are unaware of their co-infection. Um, people born before the childhood vaccine recommendation. So again, that was officially instated in 1991. But if you listen to Dr. Wester's um, presentation earlier, you heard that it took about 10 years for that really to start kick, kicking off in the US for those vaccination rates to go up since uh, the recommendation was instated. And this is really significant. And I highlighted healthcare workers because in the United States, healthcare workers make up about 6% of the US population on average, their age is about 50 years for a nurse and a majority of both full and part-time nurses are between 45 and 59 years old in the United States. 
So that means that there is a majority or at least a significant proportion of healthcare workers out there who were born before the recommendations might not be vaccinated. And in fact, some of the Hepatitis B Foundation's um, consult line um, have been in regards to nurses who said, well, I've been vaccinated in the past, I've gotten one or two doses, but I had to get my titers checked and you know, they're low or I haven't received any, I thought it was vaccinated, but it turns out that I wasn't, but you know, my hospital facility is requiring me to get vaccinated. What do I need to do? Um, so another missing group are foreign born persons immigrating to the US. So currently the ACIP, so the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and the United States Task Force on Preventative Services recommend that all individuals coming into the US from countries with high prevalence rates be screened for hepatitis B, but not immunized. The immunization part is not recommended right now. And this is really key because in 2012, 90% of foreign born individuals were migrating to the US from regions with in intermediate to high endemicity for hepatitis B. So they're coming over here already with high risk, but they're not being recommended to be immunized. And another one uh, group that is missing are occupational hazards. So we're talking about cleaners, municipal waste workers, food service workers, and others I'm sure that I probably missed. But the threat of needle sticks is not only coming from the opioid crisis. Um, in the United States, there's been a large increase of self-administered um, treatments using needles. And this has led to a rise in improperly disposed needles. So about 95% of needles, despite guidelines by um, local, national, um, and state states, 95% of needles are still discarded in municipal waste streams. So this means that individuals who might just be getting a temporary job, who might be working in um, a public facing job for many years, where they might have to take out the trash or do other things of that nature, they might be coming into contact with um, these needles. We've actually had a call from an individual who was cleaning a room in a hotel and she was stuck by a needle that had been left there and she actually ended up developing hepatitis B. And she should have been vaccinated by all means, but for, um, unfortunately she was not. And so we know that this is a risk. So moving on, what are the other current barriers to increased vaccination? For one, the current guidelines, um, as we spoke about a little bit, are very complicated. Um, there are about 18 risk factors by the CDC and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force that are listed that people should be uh, analyzed for and checked for, for their risk for hepatitis B. And according to calculations, about 84% of adults meet at least one of these current recommendation guidelines. In addition to this, there are several high-risk categories that are expected to grow over the next several years. So diabetes, that group is expected to grow by 165% by 2050. For individuals living with SCDs, it's supposed to grow by about 20 million cases a year in the future. So these are individuals that currently might not be living with it, but they definitely will be included in the future. We need to make sure that we're capturing them. Yes, and as I mentioned, all of these must be assessed by providers. And we already know that providers are very taxed and burdened with doing 10 million other things that they need to check off to make sure an individual is healthy. And also they rely on risk-based risk conversations with patients. And patients not always feel comfortable disclosing the fact that they might have used drugs in the past or they're currently using drugs, that they might be having unprotected sex. So these are conversations that even if a provider starts them, a person might not feel comfortable disclosing what's actually going on in their lives. Um, in terms of costs and coverage, uh, individuals, as I'm sure we all know, might lack health insurance, um, which is a big barrier to getting this. Um, so as I mentioned before, in terms of Medicaid, we spoke about the vaccine should be available to all who want the vaccine. Um, and that's the recommendation. However, with Medicaid Part B, that actually only covers individuals who are medium to high risk. So if you're on Medicaid and you want the hepatitis B vaccine, you can't just get it without paying something um, upfront. And that can be a major barrier uh, to individuals. And that list for Medicaid for what the risks are is again, comes back to the ACIP's recommendations. So what they list, what they list as risk-based. And 
We also have access um, by states as a kind of barrier. What are their barriers? So we actually conducted a study earlier this year um, to see what barriers states might face when it comes to accessing and providing the hepatitis B vaccine for adults. Um, and this is, comes down to 317, which uh, I, some of you might be familiar with and we can talk about a little bit later. But the 317 program varies by state. So it's a state to state thing. Um, some of the 317 programs uh, work with uninsured adults and um, underinsured adults. Others car carry uh, coverage for individuals in correctional facilities, others don't. So basically, who has access to the hepatitis B vaccine? Like many other things in health, it depends upon where you live. Um, so what our survey specifically found was that 52% of states do not actually allow for uh, 317 funds to cover syringe service programs. And about 74% of surveyed, uh, survey recipients who responded said that their immunization programs received $1 million or less for 317. And so what that means is that that number seems high, $1 million, but for 317 programs, that covers a list of vaccines. So it really comes down to who is getting what as you can guess, I'm sure flu probably gets a lot. Um, and then what trickles down is what they, uh, what, how they break it down for the rest of the vaccines. So for some states, for hepatitis B specifically, they based it upon outbreaks. They mentioned that they had to divert funding hepatitis B to hepatitis A outbreak um, and several other factors that you know just happened to come up and they needed the money for different um, reasons. And so that funding is not always guaranteed for um, certain vaccines, which is a major, major barrier to increasing vaccination rates. Then we can talk a little bit more about logistical blocks. For hepatitis B, there's a prescription uh, required in some states. This makes it difficult for certain high-risk groups, um, such as people experiencing homelessness, perhaps, or people who might use drugs to access care. We have uh, stock storage, and stock and storage are really, really big uh, deals. So for some individuals, we've heard that having space to store the hepatitis B vaccine, maybe they're a smaller clinic, they just don't have it on hand and they don't have a, a refrigerator that can process and hold that. Um, they've also heard about pharmacy reimbursement issues. So providers and pharmacies might be able to provide the vaccine, they have it, but there's really no incentive to do so or to keep it in stock constantly if there's not really high demand and they're not being reimbursed well for it. So there's a lot of complexities with that. And then there's also just a lack of state and federal funding in general for vaccinations, but specifically, again, hepatitis B vaccination. And the provider burden information I've taken directly from a survey conducted by the HHS um, National Survey Program, uh, oh, sorry, National Vaccine Program. And so what it actually found was that approximately 31% of adults are unaware that they need a vaccine besides the flu shot. So let me say that again, 31% of adults are unaware, completely unaware that they need a vaccine besides the flu shot. And then 11% of adults know that they need more vaccines than just the flu shot, but they aren't even thinking about getting them. So that's really significant because even that those parts that, yeah, I do know I need a vaccine, they're not even considering that they should be asking the doctor about what to get or what might be recommended specifically for them if they're in a high risk group or anything of that nature. So that's really, really key. Um, so another burden is that people often have multiple healthcare providers. So across that span, who is recommending what should be given? Um, is one doctor telling them that should get the hep B and another one isn't? What's happening? We don't know those conversations. Um, and that's really, really key when it comes to this. Another is that there's a lack, there's a lack of, or maybe perhaps weak provider recommendations. So we all know that when we go to the doctor and it's flu season, they go, you really should get the flu shot. You know, the flu is going to be, you know, a really bad flu season this year. You definitely should get that. But what happens when you're going for hepatitis B? Do they say anything about it? Are they just like, yeah, if you bring it up, you should get it? Or how are we recommending that? So your tone as a provider and how you're suggesting things definitely matters because providers are often who a lot of people trust. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about um, education. It's not just um, you know, community groups education, but educating uh, individuals, but providers 
we also need their, to work with them too. And there's also a disproportionate emphasis on other vaccines. And again, we see this a lot, um, specifically with flu. I'm just saying flu because flu is obviously the most common one. It's flu season and we all know flu is important um, to get. But yeah, there's definitely a noted disproportionate emphasis on other vaccines that we need to be aware of. But we need to make sure, especially during um, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're talking about all vaccines that people need because um, these are preventable. There's no reason why people should be um, getting these diseases uh, in 2020. Uh, one second. All right, so why now? Why are we having this conversation about increasing adult vaccination now? Well, one, it's a conversation that we've had many, many times and we've been having it for many years. But specifically now, it's really, really important um, when we're thinking of COVID-19 and beyond. For one, many studies have shown across um, the span, and especially this year, um, that we have been suspending STI outreach, so sexual transmitted infections and disease outreach, and hepatitis programs. Uh, we've been impacted, the place programs have been impacted significantly due to COVID-19. Obviously, we know that it was a learning curve. A lot of programs, excuse me, have been face-to-face. -face. We're out there in the public, we're talking to people, um, we're touching them, all things you're not allowed to do in COVID-19. And so a survey of clinical providers, health departments, and community-based organizations said that, you know, this is really, really dangerous. It's basically between decreased um, vaccination and suspended outreach, a perfect storm in the making for future um, when it comes to hepatitis B and other diseases. So 62% of health departments said that they were substantially impacted. And we know that this is really key because health departments are a big part of giving out vaccinations. Um, and community-based, uh, but Community-based organizations said that their vaccine distribution has decreased to just 58% during COVID. Again, this is key because often community-based organizations are meeting with people where they are. They're willing to work with them. Um, you know, they're, on mobile, they're mobilizing the community, going out there, talking to people, translating things to make sure people understand the seriousness. And when that's suddenly cut out, then, you know, all of those resources that go with it are cut out. So hepatitis B is also, as we all know, an underlying condition for um, COVID-19, which means that somebody who contracts hepatitis B um, or is living with hepatitis B and then contracts COVID might have or are at risk for a significantly um, severe response to COVID-19. And so this is, again, preventable. We already know that hepatitis B cases, acute cases, are rising in the United States, and a lot of times acute cases have no symptoms. Hepatitis B in general has no symptoms. So if we're out there, if we're vaccinating and helping to increase vaccination rates, then we can prevent um, you know, this severe reaction to uh, COVID if we can just prevent somebody from getting hepatitis B. Um, so up to 67% of chronically infected individuals do not know that they are currently living with hepatitis B. Again, with less testing, that means that we're having individuals out there who are unaware. Um, and if they're unaware and that they're continuing to do their day-to-day -day things, they might potentially be spreading hepatitis B. And we also have research that shows that the opioid epidemic um, is actually being exacerbated by COVID-19. This is definitely worrisome because a lot of the resources that we're helping with the opioid epidemic have, again, slowed down or come to a halt. Um, you know, when we're talking about harm reduction, harm reduction has been a great partner when it has come to testing and vaccinating individuals. Those come to a halt as well. But also, if more people are using in the opioid epidemic and they're not being able to receive those resources, if they don't have the knowledge that they can potentially be spreading, you know, infectious diseases um, through these certain practices, it, again, becomes very dangerous. And we also have evidence that health disparities are increasing due to COVID-19. Um, so the first bullet point says that in July 2020, we had um, data showing that Asian Americans case fatality um, in San Francisco specifically was um, 5.3 versus 1.3 for the general population of San Francisco. This is again key because we know that underreporting is significant when it comes to Asian Americans with COVID-19, but Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are also at increased for hepatitis B. So again, it's that core factor that we need to be paying attention to. 
again, Black Americans, um, two times the rate of white Americans, another significant because Black Americans um, and African immigrants are lumped together oftentimes, oftentimes. So we can't really separate that out, but we can assume that African immigrants are included in this number and African immigrants are at increased risk for hepatitis B. And we know that liver cancer is on the rise. Uh, we've had the largest increase in incidence of any cancer in recent, recent years, and that data just came out this year. And it's also the second most common cause of death for API, so uh, um, Asian American and Pacific Islander males. And so these health disparities are quite dis significant and hepatitis B vaccination is really, really key to help achieving health equity in a lot of these groups. And hepatitis B has been receiving quite a lot of federal attention in recent years. Um, this is not by surprise. We've been pushing for it. We've been fighting for it. Um, and, you know, it's been declared that hepatitis B is, B, hepatitis B and all virus hepatitis can be eliminated by 2030, but we need to do the work to get there. Um, in 2020, they declared CDC, excuse me, declared hepatitis a winnable public health battle, specifically noting that vaccination, again, is the way to get there. Healthy People 2030, again, mentions reducing hepatitis B cases. How do you reduce cases? One of the ways is to vaccinate. Uh, the Division of Viral Hepatitis 2025 strategic plan is also really, really important. And we noting that because it actually calls for the expanded hepatitis B vaccination recommendations by ACIP. And so that goes back to what we were talking about earlier is how a broader definition could really, really help um, a lot of our issues and to eliminate a lot of barriers that we're currently having. And the 2020 National Viral Hepatitis Progress Report, also key document when it comes to federal attention for hepatitis B. Hepatitis B again is uh, vaccination, one of the key, key driving factors of what's going on. And Another reason is that all of the goals and, you know, despite the fact that we have federal attention, everything has been really stagnant. The goals have been pretty much oscillating around the same things for many, many years. And yet we've had new cases rising since the 2014 baselines that the federal government goes off of. The CDC also said themselves in the strategic plan or excuse me, the viral hepatitis uh, progress report that only minimal progress has been made in reducing new hepatitis B infections overall. Um, that is concerning that the numbers are basically remaining the same. If we have the tools, we have the resources and we know what needs to be done, then why is it not really changing? And um, yeah, so it remains a goal, but even with just minor incremental updates, we need more action. Minor incremental updates just mean that, you know, one or two, and this is not obviously accurate, but one or two more people here and there might be getting um, vaccinated as opposed to 10 or 20 or that we could actually be reaching and making sure that they receive vaccination. And so in conclusion, what do we actually need to increase these rates? So number one, funding. Funding is always key. We need funding for the community groups on the ground. We need funding for the providers and proper reimbursement methods for our providers and um, pharmacists who are really trying. Um, this is not anything new, but it's something that we definitely need to keep in mind as we're fighting, especially since I know that many of us want to start doing advocacy on a state level as well. Funding is simply key and something that we shouldn't be scared to ask for either. Um, adherence. So we have a three dose vaccine given over uh, six months and we have a two dose vaccine given over one month. And so we know that rates often drop off when you have multiple doses of a vaccine. So are we making sure that we're including that in um, a conversation? Are we making sure that we're saying, you know, you need all three or all two doses in order to be fully immunized? Or do people still leave the conversation thinking that it's okay just to have two um, doses or one dose, depending on what vaccine they're getting? Uh, awareness, I can't stress this enough. It's not only awareness um, for the individuals, but are our providers. Um, we can't only talk about educating the public when we know that this issue is systemic in nature. We know that it is a wide group of people who need to be educated. Um, and so I wanted to add a little bit of an example of uh, education and advocacy and awareness all wrapped into one. So earlier this year, pre-pandemic and 
February 2020. Um, I was actually in Philadelphia working with Happy United Philadelphia. And uh, we were working on trying to think of how can we express and educate more people all at once. And we wanted to work on state advocacy as well. And so we started reaching out to local legislators and holding meetings and talking about hepatitis B and elimination. And one of the things that we actually ended up doing was we talked to um, State Representative Donna Bullock um, in February of this year about hepatitis, specifically in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, where she was based. And um, then COVID-19 happened and craziness occurred. And you know, one of the things that we had asked for was a resolution for um, hepatitis B declaring May Hepatitis Awareness Month um, and also May 19th as Hepatitis Testing Day in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we thought these two things were, you know, key uh, to helping to spread education and awareness in the state, not only Philadelphia, which is where we're based, but the entire state. And actually, we had thought nothing actually might come of it since um, COVID-19 kind of took over the fold and larger conversation and put a lot of things on hold. She actually remembered our conversation and remembered how willing we were to work in, with her in Harrisburg and to go up there and to help talk to other, every, every, do the work to work with other individuals and find, you know, a bipartisan group to support this. And she remembered all of that and ended up introducing this uh, resolution and it got 26 co-sponsors and has currently been passed on to the House uh, Health Committee for review. And it's bipartisan, which is really, really good. So we have both sides um, worried about this issue and we know that they're invested in it. And it's a great way to start the conversation. So awareness is not, all of this to say that awareness is not just you, to the individual, it's us to the legislators, it's us to the providers who might not realize what this issue is. It's us to basically everybody. And it's a lot, it's a burden definitely, but it's really important. And then finally, updated ACIP guidelines. Just as we mentioned, ACIP is kind of at the center of all these recommendations. A lot of state programs, a lot of um, local programs, everything, everybody likes everything to be evidence-based, right? And ACIP is evidence-based. So when they make a recommendation, it sticks. And when all the other federal documents who are planning for five, you know, years out are relying on these recommendations, that means that for five years, we can't really move forward if the recommendations are just remaining the same. We know what needs to be done, but we need to expand um, upon that. And so updated guidelines would certainly be helpful. And with that, I am going to end my talk and I'm going to introduce uh, Sonia Clay, who will be speaking um, more about policy. Um, so just one. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and in fact, I'm going to move. So give me one second because I actually was taking, I was just looking at the slides. Um, so I don't have the slides in front of me. So hold on a second. So I'll just say thank you for um, inviting me to speak on behalf of the Vaccinate Your Family. Um, my name is Sonia Clay. I'm the government relations consultant um, with Vaccinate Your Family. Next slide. Um, and Vaccinate Your Family is an organization founded in 1991 by First Lady Rosalind Carter and former First Lady of Arkansas Betty Bumpers. And it started as an organization aimed at improving immunization rates for kids. And within the last five years really has expanded its focus on uh, vaccinations across the lifespan such uh, is the change of the name from earlier, every child by two, to now vaccinate your family. Next slide. So the way that uh, vaccinate your family works, we work in partnerships um, with federal agencies and we are members of a number of different coalitions. So recently with uh, COVID, we've been working with the FDA to brief uh, different stakeholders um, about the upcoming COVID vaccination. Uh, this slide is fine. Um, but then we also are a member of the Adult Vaccine Access Coalition, the 317 Coalition, and we work with a number of um, organizations that serve communities of color uh, to educate, to focus on um, vaccinations at the community level. 
um, to educate communities about the importance of uh, addressing vaccine hesitance. Next slide. So we'll say that what I plan to do is really provide a high level overview of what I've learned. And so prior to working with Vaccinate Your Family, I also worked in government affairs for the American Academy of Pediatrics and also for the American Academy of Family Physicians. So what I wanna share is a little bit of lessons learned and what I'm seeing right now uh, that might be useful for uh, plans in terms of promoting universal access to a hep B vaccination. Um, so as Michaela said, you know, the challenges associated with uh, a universal hep B vaccination include low vaccine rates. Um, also on the issue of healthcare, we, we, and this is definitely something that was said often within the medical society community that, you know, as a country, we, um, and I will say going back to the low vaccination rates, on average for the adult population, uh, we are not meeting our Healthy People 2020, 2030 goals. Um, and fewer than half of those who are eligible for influenza are getting their vaccines. And then within the population that are eligible for Hep B, the vaccination rates are even lower. So I believe it's about a quarter of those who are eligible. Um, another challenge is just that we live in a world where um, we focus much more of our attention in healthcare dollars on treatment of uh, diseases versus prevention. Um, so oftentimes um, a lot of the emphasis for, for both for payers as well as for programs um, emphasize treatment. Um, also this issue of primary care access is also really important. Uh, CDC and others have indicated that the best place to get um, vaccinated is to have a medical home. So again, if you have a medical home, you have a place that you can go, your doctor will you know, know you very well. And also they can build a relationship um, in order to effectively provide that uh, vaccination uh, recommendation. Um, it's also having, for those who have um, a medical home, they're much more likely to have uh, gotten their immunizations as well. Of course, as we know, vaccine, vaccine hesitance is a growing challenge. Um, and one thing that we've noticed is, although at the pediatric uh, level, especially for infants, the vaccination rates are really high, we're also seeing a growing number of um, toddlers, those that are entering school, uh, like pre-K, there's a higher number of um, those in the pediatric population that are not getting vaccinated. And I know that there are lots of efforts at the state level to address that challenge. Um, and then of course, for the growing number of immigrants, um, of course, vaccines are also getting immunized and getting updated. It's also a challenge, especially because um, patients, the pediatric patients um, in some states are often um, uninsured, which is also associated with lower immunization rates. Um, as Michaela mentioned, there's a lack of robust funding. Um, both to access vaccines, but also I'm going to say on the issue of public education. This is also an issue that's really come into its own only within the last couple of years. Um, so we have the 317 program, we have the Vaccines for Children program, and then we also have funding um, that's authorized under the Affordable Care Act, the Public Health and Prevention Fund, which also um, has been used to provide access to vaccines. So in some cases, a pretty high proportion of vaccines are also provided through uh, the prevention fund, but over the years, that funding has been used for other purposes. So as advocates continue to um, promote funding for vaccine access, it's important to sort of think about those different buckets. Um, also the issue of policymaker awareness is also really important. I've been working in this space um, of, of, educate, of, of advocating for vaccines at least for the past six years. Um, and what's really interesting is, you know, before COVID, every year policymakers would, you know, have their annual like flu hearing and aren't flus great? I mean, isn't it important, you know, vaccines save lives, <laughs> vaccines save lives, isn't that important? But there really haven't been very many robust discussions about all of the other mechanisms to make the vaccine infrastructure work. How do we improve um, 
the information, informa the IIS systems, the immunization information systems, where the information is stored in a medical record and is reported back to public health departments, especially for those who have to access multiple, multiple dose vaccines, that's important. People may not remember if they have the proper vaccination. So that's been an important um, issue that we've worked on on the adult side. Um, so again, and one thing that I've noticed of, since COVID, there has been a, a rise in the number of policymakers who've kind of stepped up to the plate who are interested in learning more about immunization policy, um, including uh, the, the various um, immunizations that are necessary. Um, I'll also say just an important lesson that we've learned from COVID is just ineffective outreach to at-risk at populations. Um, again, a high proportion of people who are at risk don't realize it, but also how we communicate um, to at-risk populations has been has been less than optimal. Um, next slide, because I'll continue that. Thanks. So I think the opportunity, but so there, but there are opportunities for, for progress. Obviously, with um, the new administration, um, both COVID and healthcare are top priorities. Um, on a national level, the new administration has committed to working to improve the current healthcare law, which of course includes coverage for um, both screening and coverage for high-risk populations under the ACA. So both for children, women, and adults, uh, those preventive services uh, that are a list of a menu of services that individuals can access with no cost share does include Hep B screening, but again, it is targeted for um, at-risk populations. So, but again, as we continue, if there are opportunities to amend the law and make it better, certainly that creates an opportunity to talk about Hep B vaccination and the need to broaden um, to broaden to broaden the coverage or to broaden the definition uh, of who's covered. Um, again, I think with COVID-19 and especially with the upcoming vaccination um, that will be accessible to people, I think it's gonna create a really powerful opportunity to talk about vaccines in general. I've been participating in quite a few conversations um, with, uh, with, with folks outside of DC just about vaccines. And I think this is a powerful opportunity to talk about immunizations, it's a powerful opportunity to talk to people about just how they work, why they're here, and just, and especially for those existing vaccinations, it's an opportunity to talk about just their success over the long term. Because again, contrasting COVID, the, the upcoming COVID vaccination um, with other, I mean, it's it, it will be new, it will be novel. So I think for advocates, it's a powerful opportunity to talk about the existing and mature vaccines that exists that can keep people safe. Um, so I, I think that as Congress, I mean, as the vaccines roll out, um, you know, Congress will be looking at this process, but I think it certainly opens up a really important opportunity for people to really talk about the Hep B vaccination and just the potential um, to improve life, to, to save lives over the lifespan. Um, and, and, I, and, 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 and in integrating that within adult vaccine um, policies, as I mentioned before, you know, the Adult Vaccine Access Coalition, we're working to improve the information systems that talk to each other, that where, where people can have a clear record of what vaccines they've gotten. As an adult, I've actually been vaccinated with, I've actually received the Hep B vaccination, but honestly, I totally forgot about it because I'd traveled overseas. Um, but again, having the information systems working and communicating between states, and integrated seamlessly within the medical records. Um, it's something that we're working on just so that people can really be aware of it, access their information and know when they got vaccinated, what they're vaccinated for, because the average, um, the average person just doesn't know, especially adults, including young adults. They just don't know which, when the, what vaccination they had uh, besides influenza besides influenza, excuse me. Um, I'd say another opportunity, oh, and, and other policies that we're working on um, over, the, over the last year to two, it's also included expanding access, making sure that coverage 
within Medicare and with Medicaid are much more consistent. So again, the ACA provides coverage and it provide and it encourages screening and it does provide it encourages prevention. But again, it's not universal. And then it varies from state to state, as Michaela said. Um, and so as a result, that pat patchwork does create a bit of confusion for physicians who have a limited amount of time. And if there's not, if they're and, and having worked with physicians, if they're not clear on even something as simple as pneumococcal, which is you know two dose and within a very limited population, it also gets way more complicated when you're talking about um, risk populations. So again, I think that continuing to work within the within st uh, stakeholder organizations, within stakeholder coalitions, I think there are opportunities to continue to continue to continue to advance this issue. Um, also working within the patient populations, it's also going to be important. So um, again, groups like the American Diabetes Association, as well as um, vulnerable populations such as um, Native American populations, I think it will also create some important opportunities. Because again, there are lots of great integration, I mean, intersections uh, between at-risk populations and some of the unique um, diseases that, that they're at risk for. Um, in addition to that, um, obviously the opioid crisis continues to be um, a really important policy issue, both at the state and the federal level. Um, so continuing to work with those champions and also at the state level, um, Medicaid is an important program um, for providing medication assisted treatment. So I think thinking about policy opportunities to integrate um, immunization within those settings and all the other vulnerable settings, such as um, programs for the homeless, I think those are really some great ideas that people have discussed as well. Um, and again, the success of childhood vaccines certainly you know, bolsters um, this issue as a, as a big picture discussion item. Uh, particularly from a public education perspective. And again, I think an important opportunity is that, you know, for the first time, um, Congress is considering legislation uh, to fund public education for vaccines to address vaccine hesitance. A lot of the funding is focused on the childhood population, but I definitely believe that it will create opportunities to expand uh, to really kind of provide that funding at the local level to expand resources to continue to address that issue. I, I honestly, you know, I've been, again, working with in the adult vaccine population for a while. And I think even among public health advocates, I'm not sure that people fully understand the extent of vaccine hesitance among the adult population. Um, and I think that with COVID, I think that people are going to get a front row seat with just how hesitant people are about getting immunized. And I, I predict that there will be a lot more funds um, allocated for public education and outreach, particularly for at-risk populations over the next couple of years. Um, next slide. So I think just to punctuate what I said before, the potential opportunities for advancing. I mean, I don't think that there's going to be a quote single shot to get to universal access, and that was a pun. Um, but I think that there might be a number of different, you know, incremental opportunities to move forward. As I mentioned before, uh, both at the administration level, um, with the new Biden administration and the new Congress healthcare reform will continue to be an issue, whether it's talking about the, uh, the ACA or universal access as a whole. Again, I, with this new, um, with the new federal government and new agency leaders, um, a number of leaders are gonna be looking at um, Medicaid waivers. So there are a number of different type of waivers that can be used, some of which promote um, innovation. So I think as people work to, with their states, um, really thinking about Medicaid waivers and ways to integrate um, Hep B vaccination, especially for at-risk populations, but really kind of thinking more broadly. And I think working with state Medicaid directors, I think that could be a really powerful conversation for, for next year. Um, again, I think I'd say on the federal level, um, legislators are still, will 
as the vaccines roll out, I think, again, looking at chronic disease management, it's a priority for some key legislators at the federal level. So again, looking to um, really integrate efforts to address chronic disease with Hep B vaccination, I think can help move the needle as well, um, as, as well as um, different proposals to address healthcare disparities as a whole. Again, I think in the next year or two, actually the next couple of years will be a time to talk about infectious disease, COVID in particular, but I think it also opens up the door for some really important discussions about um, Hep B uh, and how we can increase and make the universal, and to make Hep B a much more universal uh, vaccine than it is right now. Next slide. So really quickly, I've just created a list of the different bills. And I think it just kind of illustrates just the, I mean, I will say five years ago, none of these bills were in existence. And many of the bills that are listed here have only been introduced in the past two years. So again, the Vaccines Act, it promotes education, um, community immunity, provides local money to um, invest in communities that are focused on, it's focused on the COVID vaccine, but to improve, um, to address hesitance. And then there are a number of other bills that are designed to increase access to make health insurance coverage much more consistent and to um, address uh, that research. Next slide. So finally, I'm just saying, you know, and, and, and with the slides, and, and it's something you can review on your own, I've included a list of the champions. And I will say there's some amazing new champions in Congress right now. Um, more physicians, nurses like Lauren Underwood from Illinois, Kim Schreier from Washington State, and then of course, um, a couple of members like Bo Larry Bouchon from Indiana, Mike Burgess from Texas, Buddy Carter. Carter. And I list them, um, not necessarily in terms of priority, but at least the top three um, house legislators are either physicians or pharmacists, former physicians and pharmacists, and we have more physicians and pharmacists and former health professionals in Congress than we've had before. And these are the folks that are really leading the charge um, on vaccine legislation. Final slide. So I'd just say as an FYI, um, you know, vaccine, for more information on at least our perspective on immunization issues, uh, vaccinate your family issues, an annual state of the immunion report which will be released on um, February 2021. And if you want more information from me, you can contact me at Sonia at vaccinateyourfamily.org. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, and I love the immunion, state of immunion. That's a great, another play on words. <laughs> yeah. And today to wrap up um, our presentations, we will be sharing um, a presentation from Dr. Sha Wang, who will be talking more on from the clinical setting and discussing how they're tackling um, hepatitis B immunization amongst the adult community that way. Hi, my name is Cha Wang and I am an infectious diseases doctor. I practice in Seattle, Washington. Uh, the study is called uh, the HIT B project, the HIT standing for Health Information Technology. And the study is entitled Reducing Hepatitis B Disparities Through Health Information Technology. ICHS is uh, the abbreviation for International District uh, Health Center. And it is located in the International District in uh, Seattle, Washington, although there are multiple satellite clinics throughout the greater Seattle area. Uh, the clinic itself started in 1973, really is just a storefront because that need was identified for culturally appropriate care for Asians living in the International District. The clinic has since grown tremendously, now consisting of four main clinics offering a broad range of clinical services, including medical, dental, acupuncture, vision, laboratory, and pharmacy services. Uh, in addition, there are multiple other clinics, uh, healthcare centers within some of our public schools to provide culturally, culturally appropriate care. Uh, mostly to an immigrant population. I took these photos actually on my bike ride to clinic shortly after the uh, demonstrations and protests that occurred uh, after George Floyd died. Uh, and so during that time, Seattle was in the news. It wasn't as bad as 
uh, the news, uh, national news portrayed it, but we did have some smashed windows and vandalism. And so a lot of the businesses in the international district put up uh, plywood over their windows and then the uh, street artists just sort of organically uh, with, you know, without any sort of larger organization would just show up to paint uh, the windows with various uh, beautiful pieces of art. And so I'm just showing a couple of representative pieces that appeared around the clinic at that time. Uh, so the clinic is a federally qualified health center or FQHC and some of the demographics are shown on this slide. So as you can see, primarily uh, our clinic population is a low income population and we primarily serve uh, persons of color. We serve a, a wide age range of patients and uh, we also uh, serve as one of the sort of uh, medical uh, safety net clinics for the Seattle area. One in 10 of our patients is homeless. Uh, as I mentioned, we provide not just medical care, but also dental care, behavioral health care, vision care, uh, acupuncture. There's a pharmacy on site, a laboratory on site. So it's an environment in which patients who uh, don't speak English can walk in and primarily really function within their, their primary language. Uh, so we are able to provide care uh, in a culturally sensitive way. More than half of our patients are Medicaid patients and more than half need interpretation services. As mentioned, we really started off as a clinic that served the, the Asian population in Seattle, but that uh, has changed over time. And so as you can see from the top 15 languages that are spoken at the clinic, uh, we serve not just Asian populations now, but also a Sub-Saharan African population, uh, as well as folks from Eastern Europe. So that happens to coincide with the population that is most at risk for chronic hepatitis B. And as shown on this slide, uh, the prevalence of chronic hepatitis B in our clinic is high, about 70% for the Chinese and Vietnamese population. But also we have a, a Somali population and it's about 8% in that population and Southeast Asia, seven to 8% as well. So a lot of hepatitis B, which is why we decided to focus on that disease as part of this project. So uh, the title of the project is listed on this slide. It was not just my effort, but really, of course, a team effort uh, with Rosie Chang Ware from APCHO uh, being the lead author. And then we had a very talented MPH student, Mariko, uh, one of our clinic operation leaders, Michael McKee, uh, Vivian Lee served as our biostatistician and I was the senior author. So the goal was to determine the effectiveness of electronic health record tools in a community health center environment uh, to improve hepatitis B screening and vaccination rates. Our approach was a community engaged research framework uh, that helped us to, to guide every aspect of the study, including intervention design, implementation, evaluation, and dissemination. And the, the study was set within three of our main primary care clinics that are part of the ICHS network. Uh, so what is the electronic health record? Uh, for those of you who've seen a physician or a provider, you know that a lot of the time that provider is sitting tap tapping away at a keyboard, looking at a computer screen. Uh, you know, our parents did not experience medical care in that way. Back then it was all paper. So now it's really changed so that we have an electronic version of the patient's paper chart and most clinics don't even keep paper charts anymore. So there are a lot of positives to the uh, electronic medical record uh, as shown here. Data is readily available. It's easy for providers to communicate between each other. Uh, the data, as I mentioned, can be easily shared. And so really the goal is to streamline provider workflow. The reality is that most providers have a love-hate relationship with the electronic medical record. I think if you would give most primary care providers a couple of beers, they could talk for an hour about how much they hate the electronic medical record. Uh, and that's because there is a lot of frustration while it does make our job easier in many ways, in some ways it, it does cause a lot of frustration too. Uh, much more documentation is required. So back in the day when we had paper charts, we would write a quick note saying hepatitis B uh, assessment, you know, the patient's doing well, plan, 
continue antiviral. Now there's much more documentation that's required by uh, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services and other governing bodies. And so that is a burden to providers. Uh, to get around some of that burden, we do a lot of cut and pasting, which can uh, result in documentation errors. There are usability issues where you have to do so many clicks uh, to get to, to, to the task that you want. Uh, and pop-up fatigue as alerts are constantly popping up uh, to tell us to do this or that, uh, schedule a colonoscopy, don't forget the mammogram, so forth. And so uh, there are, are, is an ample amount of medical literature available on uh, the medical record and how it can be improved, the, the electronic medical record. And here is the title of one of them that kind of caught my eye, death by a thousand clicks, because that is sometimes what it feels like. Uh, so going back to the primary care clinic, so uh, I actually am not a primary care provider. I am uh, a specialist provider, but I have the uh, privilege of working side by side with primary care providers. And I can say that along with school teachers and social workers, uh, these are, are people who really should be nominated for sainthood because it is a very difficult job, actually much more difficult than, than my own job. Uh, so the, the average primary care provider sitting in clinic is usually in a, a crowded workroom. So there's a lot of uh, background noise, everybody tapping on computers and multiple side conversations going on, uh, patients popping in wanting things. So a chaotic environment. You're pressed for time because you've got to get through your clinic panel. You can't run late. Uh, you, you lack control of pace because uh, it's not up to you. It's up to how quickly it takes the, the patient to be roomed and how many questions the patient has. And, whether the patient uh, is having trouble remembering their medications and so forth. Uh, often there are family responsibilities on the side. And then of course, the big bugaboo is the electronic medical record. So I'm showing again, the goal and approaches of this study. And so really we wanted to, to show that the electronic health record could be used to improve the care in, within this community health center environment uh, with regards to hepatitis B screening and vaccination. And so we started off by uh, using this community-based framework to survey uh, multiple levels of the care team within the clinic to find out what the priorities were and whether there were any opinions as to what this intervention should look like. And I've just distilled on this slide a couple of the main uh, messages that came out of that survey. Uh, the first being that a team-based approach was preferred. So a lot of times the primary care provider feels that everything, you know, the buck stops there, everything depends on that one provider, uh, which really leaves open uh, the possibility for human error. So a team-based approach means that at multiple levels of the care team, the medical assistant, nurse, pharmacist, provider, uh, and the, the social worker, et cetera, there's the opportunity to intervene. Uh, it was felt that the intervention that we designed should be integrated into the workflow because too often people come in with something new, it's new and shiny and it's great, and then that team leaves when the grant is over and then the, the intervention dissolves as well. So really we wanted an intervention that would be integrated into the workflow so that it would sustain even after the research project was done. And then a big message was no EHR alerts, there are too many as it is, and so if you put yourself in the position of a provider, you're trying to get a task done and these pop-ups keep appearing on your screen, what are you gonna do? You're gonna click the X and close it, right? So you're really not gonna even be reading them because you don't have time. And so perhaps they're not that useful. And, and certainly we didn't want to add another one to uh, the list of pop-ups that were already appearing. Uh, and so uh, after some discussion and thinking about the survey outcome, uh, we decided to take an approach of using the EHR really to compile patient data rather than to provide something to the end user. So in other words, uh, if you think about it, the EHR, other than a paper, you know, compared to a paper chart, is just an incredibly powerful tool that allows us to, to mine data. And so we're able to mine demographic data and clinical data and then produce a report that could be helpful for designing an intervention. And so that is what we decided to do. And what probably would have taken months back in the day of the paper chart took just a matter of hours once the, you know, the appropriate query was written by our data and analysts uh, to pull this information. Uh, so one unexpected uh, barrier or obstacle that this study had to overcome was identifying act the actual risk population within the clinic for the hepatitis B intervention, because not all of the clinic patients were at risk for hepatitis B. And we felt that the study would, would sort of lose legitimacy if we were prompting providers to do something for a population that was not actually at risk. So uh, in order to identify the population, 
we first used a race variable. Uh, and clearly these races here are at risk for hepatitis B, so it was very easy to then uh, put those into the study population. But then uh, there were uh, the race variable as defined here was insufficiently, uh, was, was too broad. Uh, and so like, for example, black or African-American, we definitely wanted to pull out those patients who are from sub-Saharan Africa, which is an area of high endemicity for hepatitis B. Uh, but our race variable did not allow that. Uh, and then when we uh, sort of drilled down to the ethnicity variable, we found again that uh, the, the, the race variable did not allow that. So then we uh, looked at language, which fortunately we, did, we do collect because we need to be able to identify which patients need an interpreter. And so we then use the language variable to pull, uh, sort of to pull the languages that were spo are spoken in areas where there's a lot of hepatitis B, uh, and then uh, we're able to funnel those patients into this hepatitis B risk category as well. So this looks great on this slide, but I will say it took like three weeks of discussion for us to figure out uh, how to do this and to pull the right population. Uh, once we pulled that population, we then used the EHR data to identify which patients had been already vaccinated or were determined already to be immune by presence of surface antibody, which patients needed the vaccine, and which patients uh, were unscreened and needed to be screened. And then we designed two interventions, so they were parallel interventions. Uh, one was the provider dashboard, which I'll go into explain a little bit more, and the second, the huddle sheet, which I also will explain. And so the provider dashboard looks like this, and every month a provider will get a uh, a printed out report uh, on sort of how they're doing with various uh, goalposts of care. For example, uh, recommending colonoscopy for all patients over the age of 50. Uh, and so uh, our providers, we added an element to that dashboard for hepatitis B. Uh, here's the legend. So uh, for patients who are unscreened, shown in the darkest color, those who have chronic hep B already, uh, those who are immune and those who are not immune and so forth. And so these are um, four different providers sort of looking at the rates within their own clinic. So this is something that they could look at and say, oh, uh, you know, I have uh, too many patients who are non-immune and should be vaccinated for hepatitis B. Uh, I won't say that these reports are loved by the providers, but because they don't occur and interrupt uh, during the clinic, clinic flow, but are uh, included on a monthly basis on a provider's ho hopefully at midday where they don't have patients, uh, and it's included along with uh, the same types of reports for other chronic diseases such as diabetes uh, and hypertension. Uh, it didn't create a lot more workload for the provider, which was one of our goals. The huddle sheet, uh, this is a, a example shown here, uh, is a piece of paper basically that the uh, provider would get at the beginning of a half day clinic and they could go over it with their uh, MA. Uh, and so the MA could help them to identify things that needed to be brought up during that clinic visit. The patient may be coming in for, let's say, a medication check, but this would remind the provider that this patient is due for a colonoscopy or for a mammogram, et cetera. And so we included on this huddle sheet then information about hepatitis B status and whether or not uh, the patient needed to be vaccinated. For example, in this case, uh, the second vaccination is due. And we actually have... Uh, orders for vaccines, standing orders for vaccines, so that that part of it could actually be initiated by the MA, leaving the provider out of the loop, uh, which would then reduce the provider's workload and, and sort of was an example of multi-layer team care. And so the results of our study are shown here. Uh, and the most important result, of course, is the time period variable. So this uh, variable here indicates whether or not the patient was in the baseline time period, that is the time period before the intervention or the intervention time period, which was the time period we studied uh, that uh, during which we were using the intervention. So it's, it's just a before after study design. Uh, both were six month time periods. And you can see that in the uh, intervention time period, uh, patients were almost twice as likely to be screened for hepatitis B as they were before. Um, and so that's why I have the red asterisk here for a p-value uh, less than 0.05. And then uh, these other factors also turned out to be statistically significant, whether or not they had insurance probably related to whether or not they agreed to be uh, tested because if they were paying out of pocket, they wouldn't want additional tests. Uh, the male variable stood out here. And so uh, we weren't sure if that was because, you know, men were more likely to be swayed by a, a provider trying to convince them to be screened. 
Um, that might be part of it. I think part of it was that a lot of the women had already been screened as part of their, uh, if they had given birth and as part of their prenatal work. And that just may not have appeared in our medical record if they had come from a different clinic. Uh, but the most important thing is that our interventions appear to be uh, successful. And then this uh, second table shows the uh, rates of vaccination in the pre and post time period. And again, you can see that here, almost three times as likely to get the hepatitis B uh, vaccine in the intervention time period. So basically having the reminder given to the provider right before the clinic session uh, and, and appearing monthly on a, a dashboard appear to be effective. These are just uh, figures that show uh, the same data just to kind of give you a pictorial of it. I, uh, so this is the, uh, the graph, this is uh, months along the bottom here, and then a uh, number of tests per time period that we were counting. And you can see that clearly hepatitis B screening went up after the intervention. I thought what, one thing that's interesting about this graph is that it actually started to go up even before the intervention, because remember we were doing the survey and there were folks in the clinic sort of talking about hepatitis B. And I think it put it on everybody's radar even before we did the intervention. But then after the intervention, uh, the difference is striking. Uh, similarly, these are our vaccination rates pre and post intervention. Uh, so I lifted this table from a report that was produced by the National Academy of Sciences entitled Eliminating the Public Health Problem of Hepatitis B and C in the United States. Uh, and this was one of the, what they're really their conclusion table showing uh, the goals of ending transmission and reducing morbidity and mortality related to this ongoing infection. Uh, and then this last column here listing the barriers. And as you can see, one of the barriers, the barriers is here, much of the burden for managing chronic hepatitis B falls on overworked primary care providers. Uh, and so this study really was uh, focused at trying to reduce some of that burden with relatively easy uh, interventions. And so our conclusion was that the intervention that mined electronic health record data on hepatitis B screening and vaccination, uh, providing point of care recommendations resulted in improvement of hepatitis B screening and vaccination rates within this clinic that is uh, you know, a challenging clinic to work at just because of multiple competing needs of the, of the patients. Uh, but really, I would boil it down to this, at least from this study, I would conclude that the EHR uh, for, for a project like this really provided its greatest value, uh, not in presenting pop-ups to the provider, but in allowing data mining. So in other words, allowing us to leverage this incredibly powerful tool to get all this data out of the electronic medical record to identify a, a group that needed intervention. Uh, and then on the, on the sort of end user side, it was less electronic and more still paper-based, uh, just providing point of care recommendations in flow, in clinic flow, in order to uh, improve rates of hepatitis B screening and vaccination. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, my contact information is listed at the bottom of this slide. All right, thank you so much uh, to our presenters today. I will ask you guys to turn on um, or unmute yourselves so we can do a quick discussion. Um, to everybody who has stayed on, thank you so much. I know that we are a little past five. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And I wanna invite you all to either um, unmute yourselves um, to ask any questions, or you can feel free to type it in the chat box and we will make sure that you're seen. Um, so to our presenters, thank you so much for joining us. Um, are you able to unmute yourselves, guys? Oh, can you, can you hear me? All right, let me just make sure you guys are unmuted so that we can. All right. Hi. Hi, I'm just going to click and unmute everybody. All right, so I will start with one question that I had um, for you, Dr. Wang. Um, so you mentioned that there was a big hesitancy um, around the EHR system and you know some love-hate relationships. So I was just wondering, how could we potentially encourage providers um, to do something like this, implement something like this within their own um, practices?
Oh, apparently you guys are still having trouble unmuting yourself. Hold on a second. It's so okay. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Perfect. Good. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, Michaela. Could you repeat the question one more time? Sure. So I was saying that there, you were talking about how there seems to be some love-hate relationships between um, providers and the EHR system. So I was wondering that how could we encourage providers um, to try something like this in one of their practices, especially if they have um, a lot of high-risk uh, uh, clients? And um, yeah, I think uh, you know the most important thing is to realize that a pop-up is not always the answer. Sometimes it is the answer, but I have sat in plenty of meetings uh, where, you know, there's a particular safety issue or patient care issue that we're trying to address. And oftentimes people will say, oh, well, we should just add a pop-up. Um, and just realizing that a lot of times when providers are going through their workflow, they have, they get several pop-ups, you know, and that usually uh, the approach is just to click okay and breeze on through without really reading the pop-up and so then it sort of defeats the purpose. So I think that, that the answer to that question really is to, uh, to, to take approach in which you solicit the opinion of the providers first, to get some idea of what that clinic workflow is and then find a, a technique that integrates into the workflow. And if providers are saying, hey, a pop-up would be helpful, then to go with that. But I guess I would discourage any intervention that doesn't that doesn't have the input of the people at the front level. I think that's a really good point. Oftentimes we're like, oh, this is so easy. Maybe you should try it this way. And in reality, it doesn't always work out the way it sounds. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, I'll turn to, I think everybody can unmute themselves now. So does anybody from the audience have a question that they would like to ask? Feel free to put them in the chat or feel free to just unmute yourselves and say it. And if not, I do actually have a question um, for Sanika. So you were discussing about how there might be potential for working with state Medicaid directors um, in the next year or so or in the upcoming um, administration in times of that. So I was wondering that this is, you know, an unique approach in my opinion. How would you recommend people approach working with state Medicaid directors? Would it be the same as other legislators? Or is there something else that we should be doing to educate them? Um, how would you how would you go about that? Um, I would just say, well, reaching out, reaching just reaching out to them. I mean, um, I think going in, educating them. Um, certainly, also reaching out to governors as well. But um, I think really kind of proposing ways to expand access within the Medicaid population. Um, I think having that conversation about its importance and especially for um, especially for some at-risk populations, how, to, how can you make it easier? Um, again, like each state has a state plan that they submit to CMS. So I think just opening up a dialogue about how to integrate um, Hep B vaccination into broader state plans, I think is certainly uh, something to, to open up that conversation. Because again, there are waivers that are available for innovation. So for example, you can use, you know, Medicaid has very broad authority in terms of how funds can be used. Um, so I think to expand coverage or, or other services uh, to, to, to broader populations, I think it's certainly um, worth just having an introduction, talking about the importance of this issue, and especially because um, the cost of prevention is always going to help. Um, sometimes it drives innovation as well. So the cost of prevention will always be less expensive than treatment. Thank you. That's a really, really solid point. Um, so Dr. Wang, I'm going to oscillate back to you. Um, we had another question pop in. So um, people are wondering if you've been able to maintain um, what you've put in place uh, through the study. And if so, have there been any challenges with it or has it all been pretty smooth? Um, yeah. uh, we have been able to maintain um, because the huddle sheet is something that was already being used by the clinic and the dashboards as well. So we were just able to integrate into those systems. I would say that our biggest challenge is just having the wrong information. 
Um, so, uh, for example, uh, we have patients who may just be positive for hepatitis B core antibody. Um, and so uh, technically they don't have surface antibody and they would always pop up as needing vaccination. But in fact, some would argue that if you have core antibody, you don't actually need vaccination. And so that's an annoyance for the provider um, who has to then always go through that thought process every time. Uh, we haven't really been able to get to have a manual way to um, all our information is, is derived from uh, the EHR uh, data query. So we haven't had a manual way to correct that. So I would say that like anything, the intervention is only as good as the information that you have. Uh, our information is pretty good, but it could be better. Um, I actually have a, just one more comment and actually a question for Sonia. Uh, so my comment is uh, that uh, just to follow up on, on the answer to your question previously, Michaela, is that if you were going to propose an intervention to a primary care clinic, for example, you might not have the luxury of going in there and uh, you're getting a focus group together and asking opinion and so forth. I, in that case, though, I would provide a menu of options uh, to those if you were trying to uh, produce you know, a written document or an online document, just a menu like uh, pop-ups would be one option, uh, integrating uh, into the MA position huddle would be another and so forth. I guess I would, I would suggest that because um, obviously it's not always possible to do a focus group. We had grant funding for that. Um, my question, Sonia, uh, or, or perhaps somebody else on this panel might be able to, to address, I have kind of a, a, a real passion for increasing the ability for patients to get ultrasounds, patients with hepatitis B to get ultrasounds to screen for liver cancer. And it's a major obstacle to my care that oftentimes my patients are underinsured. So they may have insurance, I'm here in Washington State, they may have purchased insurance off the exchange, uh, but the premium to those insurance policies can be pretty high. Uh, and then if there's a significant copay, then that's a barrier. And, and a lot of times my patients will decline the ultrasound. And, that's, um, and then sometimes, you know, we, we miss a liver cancer until uh, too late or they present with symptoms. And then the, the cost of treatment for that liver cancer, of course, is incredibly high. Um, and I see like with some other diseases, for example, breast cancer, uh, our patients who are underinsured, we have other mechanisms to um, to pay for the mammogram. And then I also take care of HIV patients. And for that, I'm able to tap into, you know, the Ryan White funding or whatever to uh, get them more optimal care, more than their insurance would otherwise pay for. And I'm wondering what would be the right way to go about uh, trying to help, uh, trying to address this unmet need really, which is that underinsured uh, uh, sort of borderline, you know, low income patients uh, not being able to afford the ultrasounds they need to screen for liver cancer? Um, I can say the um, for the underinsured, I, I'll just start with like high deductible healthcare plans because I know that that's a huge area. Yeah. Well, yeah. From a policy perspective, I know that that's also an emerging um, public policy issue where um, policymakers have introduced more bills to increase access to care. So I will say like, again, I'd worked with the American Academy of Family Physicians and they've led the effort to increase access to services, um, especially if they're preventive, um, if you have a high deductible healthcare plan. So again, you have your wellness visit, but the goal is to increase um, access to follow-up visits and services, even if you beyond uh, the one visit that's authorized under the ACA. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, sometimes it's also just you may have to work with some of the insurance, the insurers, because again, um, a lot of the proposals to increase access are piecemeal. But as I had said in my presentation, there are increasing there there there's an increasing number of proposals out there to um, increase access to vaccination, and I would say in related services. Um, for like vaccination, and I would say for for um, uh, related services or infectious disease services, that certainly makes sense. And again, there's a new administration, so I think approaching the new administration and maybe even approaching them about the Medicare population um, might make the most sense because, as you know, if Medicare covers something, then it usually trickles down into private yeah. care as well. 
Well, I, th I think of the, the ultrasound for patients with hepatitis B being very similar to a colonoscopy or a mammogram. These are all preventative services, but I don't think insurance policies recognize the ultrasound as such. Right. No, I think that's important. And I think, you know, I think the two, I think within healthcare, I think the two really important vehicles for getting things done would be Medicare, Medicare Part B, and then to the VA population. Okay. Um, oftentimes some new policy innovations, uh, folks will also, uh, and in fact, the VA probably is just as good as Medicare in terms of really working to increase access. Thank you. I think that's something that we definitely can do better and that we're working on is that I think it's hard for people to make the leap from hepatitis B to liver cancer, um, especially when hepatitis B just has no symptoms. A lot of people forget it's kind of there. And then a lot of people who are educating just simply don't know that hepatitis B can lead to liver cancer. So that's definitely something I think we can all remember and put into our work. Does anybody else have any experience with working with underinsured individuals and would like to offer insight? All right. So then I think I'm going to wrap up with one more question. We're heading upon 523 and I know that the sponsor booths are open from five to six. So uh, please, I encourage you all to go over to the sponsor booths um, and check those out. And also, if you wanna provide feedback on this session, that is an event will be on the platform and we welcome your feedback and it would be great to hear from you. So does anybody have one more question or anything they're curious about for Sonia or Dr. Wong? Well, people make a comment. I just wanted to say one issue that I didn't include in my presentation was maternal health. So an opportunity to, to from a policy perspective, lots of maternal health bills that are moving forward. So it also, those legislation, those bills um, also open up opportunities to really talk about the need for some screening and uh, immunizations. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my final question for you was actually for you, um, Sonia. And so we've been hearing, and I'm not sure if you have any experience with 317 funding or 317 programs. I'm sure you do. Yeah. So um, we've been hearing a lot about trying to perhaps uh, work towards advocating for hepatitis B to at least be included on it, or perhaps trying to get more funding or for people to realize hepatitis B, you know, has been rising in the United States. We should also consider that to be um, a priority. Do you have any tips for how to speak with individuals who are 17 to encourage um, that dialogue? Um, I haven't done a lot of um, advocacy on it. I mean, I think it's, I'll be honest, it's usually like, oh, do you support the program and increasing it? So it's usually just sort of a real wholesale support for it. Um, I think, again, probably an important strategy would be to talk to CDC um, and also to talk to your states because um, at least for the funds that go to the states, um, you know, the more money that's available, the more that it, they can expand access and more that they can diversify what they can, they're able to do. Um, but I think again, it's an important chance to talk to, continue to talk. So I'm sure you're talking to C CDC now, but I think continuing to talk to CDC and again, um, if you're not part of the 317 coalition, which I assume that you may be, um, I think maybe broadening the message to broader number, you know, like not really having this sort of uh, immunization by immunization approach, but just saying it's broad. I think also centering the, the patient populations that need it, um, things of that sort. And, and again, happy to talk offline. But I think that um, ultimately, I think kind of getting in early for this administration uh, to talk with them about this issue. And I think, again, really seizing the opportunities that we are having right now to talk about infectious disease uh, within COVID, I think could you know just open up opportunities to talk about um, the ways that we can just make our entire you know, immunization system better because I think that there's going, there's a lot of attention on that right now. Um, and again, that's why I included the list of, um, at least the advocates that we've been working with um, because I think that members are looking for new ideas. Thank 
too. And just one more thing I wanted to point out in the chat box um, for Dr. Wong. Do you know if um, OBs do the triple panel for hepatitis B when we're talking about maternal health? They do all three. Um, I, I suspect that they only do the surface antigen. Um, and I think that's a great point to at least also get the surface antibody. And uh, it's a great time to vaccinate women. We know that the vaccine is safe during pregnancy um, and women who are having babies are clearly sexually active. And so, uh, you know, and they may have another baby down the road. So it would be great to get them at that time and vaccinate them. And it also, it also makes the case to the push for prenatal care, because again, yeah. For some patient populations, they're, they're not necessarily getting that free. So thank you both so much for your presentations and for joining today. This has clearly been an example of how we all, all of our fields intersect and how hepatitis B is a part of 10 million other different things, the 10 million other things are part of the hepatitis B community and how we really need to work together to push for that collaboration. So I want to thank you all. And if nobody else has any comments, Please feel free to explore the Event Mobi site some more. And tomorrow, please join us again for um, our final day at the Hope Studies Day Summit. And Michaela, I wanted to say I enjoyed your presentation also, especially oh, I hadn't really thought about the intersection between HEPI and COVID. And that was really interesting. Thank no, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone.